Welcome to the Swine Time Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Wayne. I'm one of the veterinarians here at Pipestone. Um, one of the owners in Pipestone Holdings. Uh, get to do normal day-to-day boring stuff, but today, like some days, they let me do this. I get to host the podcast, the Swine Time Podcast here at Pipestone, and I get to interview interesting guests. Sometimes they're outside of our organization. Oftentimes they're in our organization, and I'm lucky that our organization has a lot of talented people that can share interesting things with our guests. Today, I have... Jim Marzolf. Jim is the director of Pipestone Business Services. Yep. Correct me if I say anything wrong, but Pipestone Business Services that includes, oh gosh, go down the list, uh, Farm Stats, Farm Books, Farm Pro, Farm Team, and Farm Biz. And each one of those specific service offerings is something that would be set up to help farmers do things they normally wouldn't be able to do themselves that we have expertise at and can help them with. Jim, you want to introduce yourself a little, explain who you are, kind of what you do, and then we'll get into the topic of today, which is succession planning for family situations. Absolutely. Spencer, appreciate you having me. Uh, A lot of fun here. Um, Pipestone Business, yeah, like you said, we have uh, five specific services. Um, I came to Pipestone uh, five years ago already. Uh, My wife reminds me regularly, how can that already be five years? Uh, and the idea at the time, Pipestone Business Services, pieces of it existed, but it didn't all exist the way it is today. So we have it kind of packaged as a way. Um, I like to think of it this way and explain it this way. Pipestone Business Services gives farmers who are independent family farmers the capability to compete um, with information, expertise, uh, as though they're larger than they are. And so we give them scale capabilities is what I like to describe, whether it's in farm stats information or the accounting service uh, with books or the expertise through pro uh, sourcing uh, uh, employees through farm team. And then I would say just our wealth of experience and knowledge when it, as it relates to the business side of the business, Mm -hmm. um, we can bring that too. So you said that real well and haven't been, part of this group for 20 years now. I mean, that's, that's kind of the overriding MO is Mm -hmm. uh, help a a smaller farmer lever strength and power into something that they can never, but if you're all together and you got somebody coordinating you, like what your services would be, Mm -hmm. there's a lot more strength in that than if you're by yourself. You bet. Okay. That's not the topic of the day, but that's your background and where you come from Mm -hmm. uh, within this context. And the topic would be succession planning in a family situation. And it's something every, every family farm has to go through. There's, I can't think of one that wouldn't unless it was just a single generation family farm, but if it's multi-generational, it has to have some kind of succession plan. Um, where do you want to start on how you describe that? Because it's fraught with peril. Oh, there's lots to talk about as it relates to su- succession <coughs> planning. Um, first of all, there needs to be a successor and that sometimes is uh, not the family. And so uh, those end up being a little more complicated. We try to try to connect um, a successor who may not be a family member into the business, so the business can, can continue. Think of it this way, in a succession plan, every farmer is looking for their exit, right? And their family members happen to be their exit in most of the situations. But in some, some situations, that doesn't exist, so we yeah. have to create it. Yeah, so what do you think? It's about 90% of the time it's a family member or even more? Or oh, how? probably even more. Okay. Yeah, probably even more. And so the, when it's a non-family member, you said we got to find, find that person or plan it out. Is that something generally that's intentional or is that something that kind of presents itself because that person's kind of there, it's just not a family member? I don't know what, when you approach that, is it an intentional effort or, a, oh, or discovery effort? Yeah, it's very intentional. I would say we, we, when the farmer starts to signal that, Hey, um, I need to find some, some, something to do here, uh, in, in terms of an exit strategy, then we start the hunt, right? Then we try to find that person. And sometimes that doesn't happen, and the farmer, you know, exits without a successor, right, which means sale. Yeah. But um, we've had a number of situations where that's gone extremely well, right? Um, It might be one or more uh, employees. Uh, That's generally how that works, is somebody inside the organization is, is, um, you know, perceived to be a logical next choice. So, and, and what I would say is, kind of back to Pipestone business, we like to build the structure so that when that next gen comes along, that they have something that like there's management pieces in place. It's not like they have to build it. It's like they just kind of assume it. 
and um, kind of take that over from the from generation one. How much right. how much um, a piece of this is structuring your company legally, actually having an incorporation or entity somehow mm-hmm. f- formed technically and legally? Is that that's always part of it because you can't just fly into it without having some attention paid to yeah. how it's organized that way. I would say most of the time we see entities in play. Sometimes no. Uh, sometimes uh, we'll see farms try to do it as a sole proprietor. Um, you know, think of their 1040 tax return. They're trying to do it as a sole proprietor and shift the assets and the, and the business to the, to uh, generation two. Um, and a lot of times they learn from their parents and that will be a sole proprietorship as well. But I would say most of the time we see entities and most of those are either S corps, LLCs, general partnerships, or C corps. Okay. Right? It's so, not just one, there doesn't, just not one dem- dominating. It depends on the dynamics of what's involved. You might, yeah, take most of, of the structures. time, uh, it d- kind of depends on when the entity was created. Um, there are, for a while, I would say back in the 80s, C corps were a big deal. Um, today LLCs are kind of the thing. Um, if you're going to, if you're going to, uh, have any kind of crop operations, we like to keep general partnerships, um, uh, for, uh, FSA purposes. So yeah, there's lots of structural things, but I would say, um, easier to do this in an entity where we have a common vision. We're all pulling for we, not you, not me, but we, um, that seems to be much more helpful as, as, we kind of move down this path of succession. Okay. So, so some level of sophistication mm-hmm. to, to put the business together as something you look at in your hands versus this is grandpa's farm. Right. Right. Okay. Um, but, but that brings up the next thing, which is family dynamics. Um, pretty common. You've got multiple kids in a, in a family situation and only one wants to farm Yep. or two or whatever, but it's not all the kids. And, or even if it is all the kids, that changes everything because it's not all of a sudden one husband and wife often. It's... Mm-hmm three husband and wives or right. one, but then the siblings live in the twin cities and how do you be fair? How would you approach that? Yeah. Um, I think we have to be very specific about what it is that, um, who wants to farm and what are the parents, what is generation one mom and dad, uh, generally, um, what are they looking to accomplish? Do they want it to be fair or do they want it to be a hundred percent equal? Right. I've had, Generally, it's um, the farm wives uh, will want it to be equal. They want to treat all their children the same uh, mm-hmm. because they may have not gotten treated the same, right? And so they that, that's that's a defining moment in lives, right? When I didn't common. get when I didn't get treated the same, I want everybody treated the same, right? So, yeah. but that's pretty hard to do when you're doing a succession event. Um, so obviously we have to um, we have to identify what it's going to take to make generation two who's on the farm successful right we can't hamstring them and still give generation two who's not on the farm Mm -hmm. a piece of the rock somehow yeah right so they can participate but they aren't but generation two who's on the farm can still run right Right. i mean yes exactly and so i'm trying to think of in what most of the time it you can't be perfectly equal i think you Mm -hmm. just said that Mm -hmm. because the, the uphill battle of, of any individual saying, I'm going to buy this thing and make it pay for itself without mm-hmm. a lot of help from the uh, previous generation. Most of the time that can't happen. Is that a fair statement that most of the time that can't happen where everybody can be treated equal unless you've got massive stockpiles of cash that they can be doled out to kids? It's really hard for it to be equal, but when you try to, as you try to make it equal, usually what you're doing is you're carving out pieces and parts where this is as close to equal as I can get. You might get a chunk of the land. Um, the land base and, um, you know, the gener- the farming generation, um, they might get specific buildings or equipment or other assets. So it's, we kind of carve those out to make sure that it works, right? So that the, the farming generation can who do continue you, on. Who do you go to for, for advice on how to carve that out? Mm-hmm. What's the, I mean, I think you would probably provide that in some of your role here, mm-hmm. but what's, what are the go-tos for helping that? Is it? A lawyer. Well, I think, yeah, there's, uh, there, yeah, the, in terms of the people you want on your team, right? You obviously need, uh, you need an accountant or I would say a CPA, uh, typically on your team, somebody that can look out for the tax side of these transition events. Um, you need an attorney to make sure that legally we've got it, 
it all covered. Um, that we're taking care of the structure, the legal structures in place, and and um, kind of as we walk down the path, that somebody's got that in mind. And then often what I see is the CPA or the attorney may or may not be the facilitator to make sure that this thing continues to move forward. Uh, I look at it this way. Families are, um, it's like a lot of things in life. Marriage most of the time, birth, death, all of those things happen once, right? You don't get to practice it. You, you, you go through it. And so often it's, it's, uh, there are some complicated decisions. There's, um, recognizing your mortality, recognizing the end of your career, recognizing the capabilities of your children. There's all kinds of complexity that goes into trying to move that forward. And if somebody isn't facilitating it and kind of keeping, holding you, holding the, the, the family accountable to moving forward, it often stalls. Right. right? Cause in a family situation, because of general discomfort with the topic, sometimes nobody would drive it. Mm-hmm. So the, you bring up a good point. Do you, do you intentionally designate a person? It might be your family lawyer. It might be somebody to actually push that. Or how, how do you find that person and compensate that person to facilitate? Is that somebody you say specifically, I need you on a retainer to make sure this happens? Or what's the best way? That can be. That can be. Sometimes the attorney will step up. Sometimes the CPA will step up. But often they won't. And so a lot of times it's the person, it might be the business consultant or somebody that's a little bit embedded in the company, knows the fam- family dynamics, understands the financials, can drive it forward, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, what are the red flags you might see in a family? I, I can think of some, but you got first generation, second, or older generation, younger generation, um, maybe an heir apparent that's going to mm-hmm. farm, maybe not, but what, what are the things you would say this is dysfunctional, it's heading for dysfunction? Can you go through a few of those scenarios mm-hmm. where you, listeners might say, that's my situation, and yeah. then figure out how to navigate out of it? Yeah, I look at it from two perspectives. That's a nice question. Um, perspective number one is generation one. And that generally is, is, is mom and or dad ready to retire? And sometimes they're not, sometimes they're not ready to kind of contemplate this event. Right. And uh, the challenge there is when they are, we hope it's not too, we, we hope they're not too, for lack of a better term, old, mm-hmm. um, and haven't left themselves much time to make this transition event happen, right? Often it takes f- at least five, maybe 10 years to do, just by the time everybody uh, kind of settles into their spot and assets get transitioned. Um, it takes time. Yeah. And you don't want to rush through it. But that's, you just meant, said that they're, are they ready to retire? And at some point, everybody has to be ready or they just go to the grave mm-hmm. or whatever. But there has to be some point of decision. Is that... Well, farming is an interesting, um, farming and, li- and livestock production uh, is kind of an interesting thing because, um, especially on the farming side, the older generation can stay in the game for quite a while given the equipment we have. So, and they like to. And um, so it's, it's um, it tends to make it easy to kick the can down the road and not address the issue. So right. where, where do you where do you notice it becomes pathological that the uh, first generation could farm until they were a hundred, mm-hmm. but at some point the, the next generation's eighty, yeah, and like you know, they should be retiring at that yep. point. Where that, how do you know when it's a problem? I would say um, I've seen I've seen generation one, you know, the parents start the conversation when they're forty five. That's as early as I've seen it. Generally, when you're fifty five, sixty ish, sixty five. You think of a, the 10-year runway, well, if I'm 65 and I start the process, well, now when I'm 75, we're going to be finishing? Does that feel right? Mm-hmm. And for some it does, and for others it doesn't. But that also means that um, the children are going to be, what, 55, yeah. 60 when they take the farm over. Yeah, they're not spring chickens either. Exactly. So we have to balance that. You know, um, the kids, the kids want – should want some sort of control. I generally say, and that, that would be the next answer to your question here is on the, on the children's side, um, we need to get them when they're in their thirties, early forties, it's go time. That's right? a point of intentional, uh, decision-making at that mm-hmm. point, or like, this is what I want to do. And then start getting formed and shaped up for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's go time. And <clears throat> so in that moment, there will be some, some of the heirs, 
heir parents who are demonstrating their skills and abilities to do this. And when you said, you know, what things don't happen, sometimes they're not, they're not capable or they're not ready. Mm -hmm. So we have to address that. Yeah. So the next question I had is exactly that. So if, if you're the older generation, you're looking, what are the danger signs of my, my son or daughter or multiple kids or whatever is going to be involved is not ready. Mm-hmm. What, what would those be? Um, I'm just thinking behavioral things or what, yeah, what usually, are the red flags? Yeah. Usually when, when, when uh, mom and dad feel or realize that they're not ready, they won't, they won't hand them the decisions. They won't let them make, let the children make any decisions of significance because mm-hmm. they're afraid that they'll fail. Right. And I've always, you know, I always have to coach those folks and say, you got to give them a little leash, mm-hmm. right? Give them a little room to run, uh, let them make some mistakes, let them get used to making some mistakes so that they can kind of get to the big stuff. Right. But if you, if you, uh, if you aren't confident that they're going to make the right mistakes or you're, the right decisions, then you uh, you likely will not let go, okay. right? If you're Generation One, right? And so my question was, when do you know that the younger generation is a not head generation and they they can't be trusted? But that's that's a bad answer because then you your larger goal of fa- handing down the family farm isn't right. So it's, you have to let them. It's make a the challenge. Decision. Yeah, it's a. I would say it takes a lot of work. Um, it takes some coaching, quite frankly. It need it, a lot of times. I, I I've seen in my situation where I've kind of served as an advisor or consultant for folks, like I can see it. They don't necessarily see it or they're not sure if they see it, what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And so somebody just needs to address the elephant in the room and try to figure out how do we solve the problem. I've I've kind of watched a few of these generational transfers happen just with clients or people I know. And it seems like a pretty common thing is junior is going to run this, take this rented land. It's Mm going to be his, quarter or section or whatever and he's going to deal with that landowner separately or he's going to own this group of pigs or these will be his barns i see that actually pretty common it's not like we've got the whole operation he slides into a percentage of it it's it's a specific Mm -hmm. piece of land or if it's a specific barn or group of pigs is that more common to do it that way or what's what's a healthy way to transition there's no wrong way but i would say um i like to i'm a fan of trying to get us all thinking about the same direction not your pigs and my pigs, but our pigs. Okay. Not your acres and my acres, but our acres. And the less of this yours and mine we can create, um, I think the better. Because if you look at most of these families, they spent generations trying to accumulate land, scale, mm-hmm. right? All of these things that are hard to do. They've tried to accumulate over time. And the minute we start down this path of yours and mine, it's easy to bifurcate it then. Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's easy to yeah. put a wedge in there. And I like to, and some families have created these arrangements where they kind of have, uh, I'm going to say like a, like a linchpin. Like if, well, if this starts going bad, I'm just going to pull the pin and it's all mine. And that can happen, but, and that can be useful, but it can also not lend itself to, you know, we just got to work through this and yeah. work as a, a team together. I'm thinking as if the analogy is a marriage, linchpin marriages, I wouldn't describe as healthy ones. Where Agree. Like, it goes bad. I'm pulling the I'm pin. I'm just I mean, pulling these, the pin. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You got it. Well, we've chewed up 20 perfectly good minutes on this. Um, I got one question, but I don't expect an answer is how do you get, uh, a f- if there's a couple brothers farming, how do you get their wives to get along? But that's a whole separate episode. That's probably a whole nother yeah. episode. Yeah. yeah. And it's probably not me. No. <laughs> All right, Jim, thank you very much for being on the on the podcast today. If you have any closing comments, I don't know if you thought of anything we missed on this that you wanted to share because we covered a lot of area. No, I, I just, um, we have covered a lot of ground, but I would just say this is, a, this is a topic that takes a team and it takes some thought and it takes some dedication to kind of get it to the end. You got to have a vision about what it is you want to accomplish and just, it like everything, takes work to get there. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate you, you being here. The Swine Time Podcast was created for the pork industry and individual pork producers around the country. Hosted by me, Dr. Spencer Wayne with Pipestone Veterinary Services, the podcast contains pork industry news, advancements in animal care, and how to enhance your productivity. Find the Swine Time Podcast at www.pipestone.com or on your favorite listening platform.